what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you what you could have done or would have done or might have done if I'd asked you to write a summary of the fourth article. It's a very really short one, that's why I say you shouldn't do one. And I'm not going to actually write one, I'm just going to um, describe how I might go about doing it. To do this, I'm going to um, show you the, the article, and I'm going to show you also the thing that, um, the guidance that you had on how to approach this. So you can see that on the left, we've got the, the Battle of Monteperti, 13th century of violence in the Italian Hill of Death. And on the right, um, you have the, what, the, what to do with the readings. So each week you pick one of them and write these seven things. Now you should already have done two of these. Firstly, you've got to write a 200 word description. Now if you look at the article, it's not got an introduction and abstract. And this is the sort of thing you might get typically if you do go to a web page, which is where this is from. Uh, the web page is down at the bottom of the, the first sheet from here, which is the link you had. So you've got no abstract. An abstract is a summary, basically, that you can use to write your own summary. Although in many cases, abstracts are not well done. So if you base a summary on an abstract, you're probably going to be missing out some important things. And there's also no introduction, which is another place you can you can put together what's the equivalent of a summary, or that you get the information you can put into a summary. So you've just got the bare text. So what do you do? Well, you've got three pages, effectively, near enough, on this battle. Well, each of the, uh, in English, when we write, um, it's, it's usual that a paragraph, each paragraph is on a, a particular theme. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six paragraphs there. That'll be six different themes. So what is the first paragraph telling us? Well, it's starting off by saying that the 13th century was bad, a dark time, doesn't say why. And then it jumps to the 15th. Um, and say it was, it has problems, but it was also a period when things start to, um, when good things happen, that's a renaissance. And you get the rest of the 13th century in the second paragraph. So there's your information. So that's the first point. The 13th century was a, a, a century of bloody conflict in Italy. 15th, um, there was some cruel acts taking place, but there were also um, the emergence of culture. Then the next paragraph, this is talking about the 13th, 13th century. In the battle was. It's telling you that there was a power game going on all the time. So it's further e explanation for the statement that it was a, a time of unmitigated violence, which is up above it. And um, it talks about the beginning of a feud between two sides. So you'd say, okay, this is this is um, an article about a feud between two sides. And it gives you the family names and it tells you what they were actually called politically. 
medieval history is political. And here your family is given political names, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. Just they were German families originally. And you might think, well, well this is Italy. What, what are they doing there? Well, remember, nations didn't exist in the way we think of them. When you occupied a territory or you, or you ruled a territory, your most trusted um, troops, servants and so on, were the ones from your own territory. So there were a lot of, be a lot of Germans who moved into Italy. And remember, Germany is very close to Northern Italy, we've got borders on it, effectively. Um, you know, as near as, as need to be. Um, and the Holy Roman Empire was run from a German base with German emperors. Now, at that time, German emperors ruled over Italy. Now, what had happened was, um, it goes into further detail um, later on, but the, the, the German, the Holy Roman Empire was in control of the north of Italy. Um, but he gave the city-states freedom to run themselves and their surrounding environment as well. Just before this period, well, well quite, a, quite a bit before the 13th century. In the next paragraph, tells you the Gulfs became uh, upholders of papal supremacy. And the Ghibellines support the political claims of the German emperors and kings of Italy who were there who were responsible to the German emperors, effectively. Um, okay, so that's your background. So you, this is about a summary. This, is, this article is about the conflict between the two factions, the two political parties, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. It tells a story of their roots, which were in those two German families. And it also tells about how the Guelph party split into two factions. This is this part here. And the factions degenerated into gangs. So effectively, you got two political parties, Guelphs and the Ghibellines. The Guelphs had uh, a split within it for the black and white, and all three over time became um, gangs. So you keep taking this information in, okay, this is what it's all about, two families. And then you go to the next paragraph. Italy was a myriad of independent states And you had Republic of Venice, Central Italy was the Papal States. There were a lot of people ruling Italy, different parts of it. Here's some more, Southern Italy, Sicily. So this is another point. The article's telling you that Italy was, uh, was, was not a unified country. It was a country of many parts ruled differently. You get told a little bit about um, Sicily, which is relevant to this story, as you know, having read it. And if you if you look at um, who comes next, Manfredi the first ruled over southern Italy, and in northern Italy where he's regarded as the leader or the chief of the Ghibellines.
So you're getting a little bit of story about the ruling families, um, the succession through the families and so on. It talks a bit about how um, Manfredi uh, ruled, the way he ruled. He was pretty ruthless. He was unscrupulous. Um, he supported the Pope when the Pope decided to eliminate a tyrant. And the tyrant was Manfredi's brother-in-law. It's all about families. And they talk about a crusade. This was not like the, the crusades. This was just a campaign. The Guelphs uh, crusade against Isolino, who the Pope wanted eliminated. But he was painted. Isolino was painted as someone who scorned God. And the Guelphs crusade was a, a combination, a union of the, of the papacy, Venice, Milan, Ferrara, Padua, Mantua, and Cremona. In 1259, Esselino was wounded in battle. Defeat arrested. He died in prison a few days later. And his entire family was subsequently killed, which tells you more about the violence that was going on at the time. And then at that point, the relationship between the papacy and Manfredi did not significantly improve. And the Gulfs, Guelphs, and the Ghibellines also continued to have problems, particularly in Tuscany, where there was hatred between the Guelph of Florence and the Ghibelline of Siena, because both towns wanted to be in charge of the whole region of Tuscany. So what have you got so far? You've got two political factions, the Guelph and the Ghibelline. You've got a situation where the, the whole of the region, the whole of Italy, was governed by various different uh, rulers, some under the Holy Roman Emperor, some under the Pope, some independent. And they made uh, the, the, the who, from time to time, got together and, and worked together in order to achieve a particular end, such as the um, elimination of Isolino. But it was ongoing problems. The Sienese knew that the Florentines wanted to destroy their town. So you've got this ongoing dispute between the Florentines and the Sienese, which was ostensibly between the Guelph from Florence and the Ghibelline from Siena. And they asked Manfredi for help. Manfredi comes from the south, so he's coming up, they sent a force of 800 German knights. And Muslim noblemen, they're coming. She's got professional soldiers. with the Ghibelline, Sienese Ghibelline. Florence reacted to this by organizing a great coalition to, dis to destroy the Sienese. Thirty-five thousand soldiers at the disposal of the mayor of Florence. Everyone aged over 15, up to 70, took up arms, and that's the men and they were joined by troops from all over the place. Not just in Tuscany, but also in the papal towns of Perugia and Ori or Vieto, which are very close to Tuscany. Elsewhere, and from Germany, and they were using some Sienese Guelphs who wanted to take back the power, take over the power in their own place. Siena got help from Pisa. 
which is all always up to that point uh, for many years uh, an enemy of Florence and Genoa and Genoa is amongst the towns who sent troops to help Florence so you get Genoa and Florence and there were also Ghibellines of Florence fighting for the Sienese so you've got Sienese Guelph fighting for Florence and you've got Florentine Ghibellines fighting for Siena. And they wanted to take uh, power in, in the town, uh, those particular people that are mentioned at this point. Uh, they wanted to take power in the town after being in exile for 10 years. The Sienese commander in chief had about 20,000 soldiers. Florence had a lot more. And then you get the battle that comes in, in September 4th, 1260. Motoperti, a hill outside Siena. And you get a description of the battle. You, you, you get a graphic description of how the the battle was lost and won. And yet you're told what happened afterwards. So this article is about a dispute, long-term dispute between two factions, principal factions, the Guelph who supported the Pope and the Ghibellines who supported the Holy Roman Emperor focused on Florence, which was Guelph, and Siena, which was Ghibelline, both of which wanted to control the region of Tuscany. After previous encounters, a battle took place uh, at Monteperti, on September the 4th, 1260. And by the end of the battle, which involved uh, one side with over 35,000, that's the Guelph from Florence, and one the other side with 20,000, which are the Ghibelline from Siena. At the end of the battle, 10,000 people were dead and 4,000 were missing. 15,000 prisoners were taken by the Florentines. So that was, that was the Battle of Montepetti. And then you get some more. So you would end up the summary by saying, after, um, after the battle, there were still disputes ongoing. And over the course of the next 40 years, they, they continued in various ways as described in the article. It's all about various things going on. So the purpose of the article, for the purpose of the article, you would be uh, saying, well, to yourself, well, why am I reading this? What am I, what's it telling me? Why, why did the author write this? Well, the author wrote it to draw attention to just how divisive the political environment was in northern Italy during that time, to explain why it was divisive, which had all to do with the political background, and to describe what actually came to pass as a result of this conflict coming to a head. But the main thing that the purpose was about was to give, to present in detail of the background to the, the battle of Monteperti and how it was won and lost. That's the purpose.
the design, the approach is very historical. It, um, it's what we call antiquarian history. It's very descriptive. There are no sources given because this is an article. It's a journalism. These, these are history, historical journalism. You don't expect to see sources. So the approach is descriptive, antiquarian descriptive, it's just descriptive. The findings, well, how do you define the findings in this case? The findings in an article are usually given at the end. You'd expect the conclusions to say what the findings were. And sure enough, the article does have some conclusions in the final paragraph. And if you read that paragraph carefully, it gives you the outcome of it all after everything settled in. So these are the findings. After all this turmoil, after all this dispute, after this great big battle, and the fallout that came as a result, not just the deaths, but what happened afterwards, where up at the top here, Florence became Ghibelline, which could have been disastrous uh, for the history of, of accounting, because without the Florentines, it would have been a very different history. But anyway, the findings, where that after all this period of conflicts stretching over more than a hundred years, you get things beginning to get settled. But there were still some issues that lasted a great long time that led to people being in exile and all the rest of it. So it was a very long conflict that impacted what everything else that was going on in Italy at the time. What are the, the limitations of this? Well, limitations. It's hard to say. We don't know what sources were used. We don't know whether um, this is all factually based or whether there's a lot of supposition and um, assumptions being made. So limitations of this in terms of this research is so that we don't know what the research was. So limitations to the reader, us, is that we have no basis of evidence given to us in this article that tells us or confirms to us that this is all, this all happened. So it is limited due to a lack of sources. And if you read an article that has lots of assertions without any supporting statements, supporting references, or has lots of quotes, but no indication of the page number in the source where the quotes come from, you begin to question whether the research was actually valid. So you'd say it's the search has limitations in that we can't see any evidence to confirm what we've been told. So it must be questionable whether or not to believe it. We don't know whether it's true or, or false. The implications of that are that you have to be very cautious in using what's in this article in anything else. What you do in the, in, if you were researching and required this information was you would investigate what really happened what was going on between the two political factions, whether it was, it was as significant as this article tells us it was. And then you would use the sources you use, sorry, you'd use the sources you discover while doing that to provide the necessary information that tells you what's relevant, what's not. And you can then use that. So this is your starting point. That's the implication. This is a starting point. You've been alerted to a situation, you need to follow it through. 
And I'll come back to that in a minute. And finally, it's originality, it's value. Well, the value of this is it actually puts this all in one place. It gives you a coherent uh, description of what occurred and why it occurred and what the outcome was. Is it available elsewhere? You'd have to go and look. So you don't know if it's original or not. Whereas in an article, in a journal, especially a more recent one, you will often see reference to a contribution. And where it says the contribution of this article is X, that's a definition of its originality. And that's what helps you to find the originality for the article. And its originality is something that is new. It's a new piece of information, a new discovery. That's what you're looking for. We don't know if there's any um, originality in this. In terms of its value, it's a valuable place to begin doing research. So those are the sorts of things that are put in there. The critical assessment of the paper, does it make sense? Well, my experience on that is it does make sense. The, there's quite a logical progression through it. So the argument is logical. Um, are there any unsupported assertions anywhere in the article? Yeah, you know, the whole thing is unsupported assertions. Why are they not accompanied by a citation? Why are, are this is because it's in a magazine? Okay, so it was in military history, a magazine. So that's why there are no citations. If this was in um, the journal, the academic journal accounting history it would have citations, but not everything might be accompanied by them. So you'd be saying, well, why is that statement not got a citation? And quite often there is no citation because the author has been speculative and they just push things together. Other reasons are that the author has, has seen something, knows something, but can't remember where. So they just write it and hope that no one asks them where. And that's that one. The second one is preferable to the first, but both of them are not helpful. You would expect the authors to justify what they say. Where they don't, that suggests there might be a need to, to be cautious with using what's been written, where there are no supporting statements or evidence. However, quite often you'll find that, so, that a statement will be made in an article that is supported by a citation. And then a similar statement, almost identical, but differently worded, is made later, but without support. And there the author has assumed that you would remember the earlier ones. So if you're looking for assertions that are not supported with citations, what you need to do, if you want to be absolutely sure that they're not supported, is you need to, well, what I would do, is I'd highlight them. And then I'd search the rest of the document looking to see if similar things have been said elsewhere. And sometimes people make things up. Did the article add to the existing literature when it was written? Well, it was written um, in June 1996. We don't know if it added to the literature because we've got no guidance as to what's in the literature. To answer that question, you'd have to look at what was published on this topic. Now, the way I would do it is I'd look up Battle of Monteperti, Monteperti. I'd look that up using Google Scholar. And I'd look for any articles or books written before 1996, which contain that phrase. And that will give you an indication of whether the article adds to existing literature or not. And quite possibly what you will discover is that there was maybe a book written about this battle at some point before 1996, and that this is a summary of the book. But we don't know. But when you're writing this uh, summary of the article, you need to um, make up your own mind. So I would, in answering D, I would write something like, it's, it's, there's no evidence in the, in the paper or claim made in the paper, the article, that this adds to existing literature. And by the way, that's what you'd expect in an academic article. So there's no 
indication that it has the, the existing literature. In order to find out, I would need to go and look um, for the literature being published at that point. And I'd probably do it using Google Scholar, and I would do it using Google Scholar. If you wrote that, that's all you need to write. And that would be something reminding you that if you're going to ever use this information, you would do that. In terms of why you, you, you're getting this article to read, well, it'll become more apparent. But the timing of it is crucial. The, the CNEs were the people bankers. They were running banking for the Pope. There's a lot of funds involved. The Florentines were rivaling them. Remember the Sienese were Ghibelline, the Florentines were Guelph, the Guelph were the party of the Pope. The Sienese, because of their convenient situation with respect to Rome, location, respect to Rome, were favoured just because of where the, where the location was and the routes that passed through it. And when this happened, the Florentines were taken over by the Ghibelline in 1260. Florence became Ghibelline. The Pope didn't like it. And so he called for help from Charles of Anjou, who was the king of France, and Charles became chief of the Guelph in Sicily. But in 1260, Florence became Ghibelline. In 1266, there was a big battle. But in the end, everything settled down, as you know. But when that battle happened and you got the end of this dynasty, the Guelphs regained power. In 1260. In Siena and in Florence. And that meant that the Florentines, by that point, towards the end of the 1260s, had gone from being under the control of the Ghibelline, which really were controlled from Siena, to being in control themselves. And around that time was when they began to take over the running, well, firstly, of the bank, of the, of the papal funds, so they became papal bankers, and they took over control of the banking and the champagne affairs. This dispute ended Sienese power in banking and led to the development of banking across Europe over the next several centuries and to the Florentine influence on the way that accounting was done and I, bookkeeping was done at Champagne and everywhere else the banking took place across medieval Europe. So Florence was in charge. And that's probably one reason why when you look at the records kept and the champagne fairs, the books of account that were kept, and compare them to the fairs in Lyon, there are subtle differences between the two. Right, so that's why you, you had that, and that's how I would have gone around. Uh, summarizing it and I would do the same sort of thing with the articles these ones are short number two and number four are short but number four particularly is quite difficult to do all these things because you don't get the usual signals that's why I, one of the reasons I said don't don't try and write a summary on it 
So basically it's, it's something that it's good to know about because it helps you to understand why things might have changed slightly in the way accounting was done. And it explains why the, the Florentines were so forceful and the Sienese, because they came from a, a region that was severely, seriously troubled by internal strife. That's enough of that. So we'll stop at that point. <laughs>